Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious with Mikey Haddad, and we're going to talk about a unique shuttle payload you're involved with. Mikey, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure, Mark. Thank you. Well, good. You've been uh, coming to us now for over a year, uh, once a month. Mikey's been doing a highlight payload of the month. Uh, specifically, we've got one of the uh, most unique uh, flights uh, of crew and payload, mm -hmm. and you yep. were intimately involved with uh, what made it a unique situation. I had friends, yep. In fact, Tracy Gill, who was going to be here today, unfortunately, got had to fly to Marshall Space Flight Center for a lunar lander review, so he gave me a lot of information, too. Oh, he was, love he to was, have Tracy. He's been on the yeah. show. Love to hear that yeah. conversation yeah. of his review. So I'll try to give try to relay a lot of the stuff that he uh -huh. was involved with on this mission, yeah. These missions, actually, both of them. Uh, Mikey, tell us exactly what you did for how many years uh, as a NASA uh, engineer working on the shuttle. Okay. Specifically, what you call level four technicians. Level four? Okay, what it was is when I graduated from college, I entered a, a group that's called Level 4, uh, Experiment Integration. What our job was, was at the time they had started a space lab program, which was a pressurized as well as unpressurized elements that would fly in the shuttle. Uh, basically, pails that were flying in the shuttle called under the space lab program. Our job was the experiments that flew in those modules and on those platforms that were exposed to space. Our job was putting all that together. Um, the neat thing about our role was a lot of times you have at NASA where you have contractors do the physical hands-on. They turn the bolts, they push the buttons, and NASA kind of is very important, but it's kind of back a little bit. We didn't have that. In level four, I was actually the engineer. Um, we had a contractor technician, but they had NASA quality, NASA safety, NASA operations. So it was NASA doing the work that normally a contractor would do. And so that was kind of our role, which is really fun. I was a mechanical engineer, so I did structures and fluids mm -hmm. um, in level four. And it was interesting because we worked directly on the flight hardware. I would turn the bolts myself. I'd push the buttons. I'd pressurize the lines. My job was to work the flight hardware directly as an engineer for those specific missions that I was assigned to. A lot of fun. Worked that about seven years before I moved on to other activities. But it was an amazing, amazing career. Well, we've Started met career. many of them on Stay Curious. We've met, met Scott Vongen. We've met, um, who May, else is there? Maynette Smith. Maynette Smith. Hey, Maynette. Uh, we've got to get her back on here. Uh, Tracy and, Gill. Yep. And uh, Louis Delgado. Louis Delgado. Um, Damon Company Nelson Connors. was another That's person. That's right. All of us work level four, basically. Yeah. And which astronauts did you work with? A uh, number of astronauts. A lot of astronauts. We worked with, basically, we got um, the missions we worked. Because we're working directly on the flight hardware, um, the crew would come down for the testing because this is the stuff they're going to see in space. This is the this is the buttons they're going to push, and so we would became became good friends with them because we spent a lot of time with them prepping them for the mission. Mm -hmm. And then of course there was a number of individuals like Scott and Tracy that supported the flight because they'd spent so much time with the hardware, they knew that hardware like the back of their hand. And so if anything happened during the mission, they could relay to the crew. Of course the crew knew them. Hey, we worked with these people for over a year. When I hear Scott talking, I don't know that I'm talking to the right person. And so, uh, so that's just kind of what we did. It was, it was a lot of the astronauts became our friends, and of course, are still our friends today. Yeah. Well, we're going to focus on some of your friends at Shuttle Fest three, April thirteenth this year, uh, when we stage that event to honor the shuttle era with uh, the three astronomy missions. Astro one and two, of course, had a communications problem that your friend astronaut J.D. Barto mm -hmm. uh, helped solve, and I uh, hope J.D. will be involved in Shuttle Fest. And then we're going to talk about the Galileo and Magellan probes, STS-30's Magellan, 34's Galileo. They, had, uh, they were going to be Centaur rockets for a, a second stage. Mm -hmm. That didn't work out too good. And uh, both had radioactive... Uh, Thermal electric generators. Yes, on that. RTGs, yes, that, sir. That uh, created, uh, one created some news, the other one didn't. Because <laughs> as Hugh Harris said, we kept Magellan under the hat and Galileo got out too strong. But, uh, and over my head, uh, what am I looking at over my head here, Mikey? That uh, That's actually, and we'll see this later on, but that's a, actually a picture of the comet hale Bop that was taken by astronaut Don Thomas on STS-83. Right. Even though 83 wasn't a very long mission, he was able to observe this from orbit in the shuttle. So he took a picture of it. So it was just kind of a neat one to add to the And he's a discussion. native Clevelander like you are. So yep. that makes three Buckeyes we'll talk about here in a little <laughs> bit. We've met Don Thomas, haven't we? Marty Winkle, my co-producer 
and friend over here. Don's really a nice guy, isn't he, Marty? He sure is, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, he gives a lot of time. I know he talks over 200 times a year to groups, loves kids. Talk mm -hmm. about Don Thomas. You'll see pictures of him in space uh, and with uh, probably some traditional Cleveland Browns swag on there. <laughs> so uh, go Browns. Go Browns. I'm getting excited for football. But yes, uh, 1997 was when Hale Bop was naked eye, a good, a good uh, meteor. I mean, a good comet. Uh, the year before, in 95, was Hayakutake, uh, uh, um, and it was a long, stringy one. Mm -hmm. But we'll talk about that. Before we get into these missions, we'll talk about the missions of July here. Uh, Mike, you've had these 11 missions in July, uh, uh, 58 astronauts. I think 17 of them women yeah. went to space. Uh, we've got some great missions there. The one we're going to talk about is STS-94 in the upper left-hand corner there. But any of those other tickle your fancy to share with our Stay Curious listeners that you worked on? Yeah, I think it was at Space Lab 2 and then the TSS, the STS-46 from my head is in front of. I'm Space to get Lab out of the way. 2 is STS-51F mm -hmm. there. And uh, then the STS-46 was a tethered satellite, which I worked as well, yeah. Yeah, I was working with um, the satellite. Actually, I had a trip to Italy for that one. Oh, is that right? To support satellite operations, yeah. Well, you will, Kennedy Space maybe Center. we'll feature that next year when we're around. Okay. Staying Curious on there. Or uh, or that was that the reflight mission of that, or is that the first one? Yeah, that was actually two missions. There was a TSS one where it actually it um, it snagged about a hundred. The idea behind TSS was to let the tether or this it satellite out about twelve kilometers, and it hung up about eight hundred meters on the first flight, and so they reflight we flew it. They found out what the problem was, why it hung up, so they reflew it, and unfortunately the tether broke during the mission, and we lost the satellite. But it was all the way out at the, I guess. 10, 12 kilometers. Now, what would you want to do that? Get a, 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 a string of wire out 12 miles? It's a good idea. Good question. Um, what's neat about that is because of the atmosphere, the way the atmosphere is and the environment around the Earth, you have a long wire, you drag it through the atmosphere, you actually create electricity. Oh, okay. So it's a way to generate power just by physically moving through orbit. Hmm. And so that was kind of one of the ideas behind a tethered satellite. Yep. Well, why don't they do that on the ISS to generate That's power a good instead question. of solar panels? That's a good question. I don't think it generate enough. Uh -huh. You need the solar panels to be able to handle the, the power loads of the station. But, but we'll talk about some. that one day. Uh, uh, we've had Andy Allen, a supporter of our museum, mm -hmm. was a pilot of, or commander, I think, of one of those missions, mm -hmm. one of them in there. Well, we wanted to mention your book that you wrote, Space Lab. Uh, the payloads and the people, and this is what we've really enjoyed is getting to know Mikey and and uh, all your friends that uh, worked on these payloads. We're going to talk a lot about them today, but you're also involved with restoring the telescope that went to space twice. Actually, it's, uh, we call them a suite of telescopes. This is your Facebook page, Astro Restoration Project. Tell us a little about that, Mikey. Okay, yeah, the telescope package that flew on Astro, it's basically the only little telescope package that's come back. From space. You got Hubble up there, you got Webb, we had Gamma Ray Observatory, a number of satellites that were basically up there and we won't see again on the planet. Astro was different because of the shuttle and the, the complement, we were able to bring those home. And of course it flew twice and then after it was flown, the instruments kind of went back to where they were. The rest of the hardware got kind of scattered throughout um, the country and even the world. What the project is basically reassembling the telescope package and some of the sport hardware um, to be displayed so people can see it. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually going on right now. We've been doing it for almost two years, um, um, actually three. And it's it's right now, it's physically at the uh, U.S. Space and Rocket Center at Marshall. Their basically visitor center, Marshall Space Flight Center. And we've got two of the ins instruments, but that's actually what it looked like on orbit. And that's what we want to try to eventually put back together here on the ground for people to see. And we're about halfway there. we got two of the instruments on there. we got two more to go. Um, and this is actually a picture of a work on what's called the optical sensor package. That's at Marshall Space Flight Center at their atrium. And we're basically building the baffles that go on the optical sensor package that flew on the mission. And you see behind it's a support structure that we call the cruciform. It was actually a support structure for those telescopes. And this is everything. This flew in space. This, this is not mock-up. This is the stuff that flew mm -hmm. on those missions. And so we're restoring the, the flight hardware, basically... I broke out a procedure, and my procedure was a 1985 date on it that I basically updated to 2020 mm -hmm. to start putting the stuff back together. And I'm, only, I'm it's not me, just a whole 
team of us working this project. Now, does, restoration. do these parts have a, a patina to them? You see any wear marks or meteor, micrometeorite impacts, for example? Yes, we did. On some of the hardware, we saw some of the, um, where they had um, some of the micrometeorite impacts, some of the discoloration of the hardware because it flew in space. You're um, keeping that like it was? We actually cleaned some of that up, mm -hmm. yeah, because it just didn't, it didn't look right. And so we, kind of, we tried to clean it up to make it look more pristine, like when it flew. Um, instead of actually after the mission. So we did clean some of that up. Now, on an antique road show, they'd say you just took $1,000 off that, man. Right, right. <laughs> but it was, it was, a, it was a good, no. good, very good question. It was a decision. Should we leave it look like it is or should we clean it up? And the decision was, well, let's clean it up because, okay, yeah, it's discolored. But it just doesn't look right for a display, especially yeah, when you're the, in, in public and people, eh, dirty looking. Right. Thing, yeah. And so the idea with this, this is actually uh, in support of the Smithsonian up in D.C. Mm -hmm. This actually started with the uh, Smithsonian up in D.C. And so we're actually doing this project for the Smithsonian. It just happened to be currently at Marshall Space Flight Center. It, this will eventually end up in Washington, D.C. on display. Will so, people be able to look through one of the telescopes? Uh, probably not through the telescope, but we're working on a process of how the telescopes actually interacted in space, and you'll be able to maybe interact and do that. We have that's not set in stone, but it's a possibility of having people see what these instruments did in space. Yeah, they basically we, we don't want to get people right up against it, but you're close enough to see it and, and not touch it. Yeah, the idea. Well, there's an amazing story to be told about this telescope and the communication problems uh, the first time it got up to orbit that we're going to save that for another show and shuttle fast because uh, it, it uh, kind of uh, may have changed the fabric of the way things were done mm -hmm. in your uh, mm -hmm. uh, or, or, uh, ONC, the orbital and, and checkout, orbit and checkout, operations and checkout there. It's called the Neil Armstrong. Now. The Neil Armstrong building now there. Well, we want to talk a little bit about this man, your friend Sam Durance. He flew both of the Astro 1 and 2 missions, born in Tallahassee in 1943, and he lost his life uh, uh, just in May 5th at age 79. Uh, very sad. He's a good friend of our museum. Tell us a little bit about Sam. Oh, Sam was an amazing person. He was, um, I met him through the, when we were working Astro back in the 1980s. And um, we've been friends with him ever since, him and his wife, Becky. Um, and he's just, he was just one of these people that was brilliant, but he didn't talk to you like he was brilliant. Mm -hmm. Okay. You could talk, I could listen to him for hours. Just tell, just talk about his missions, the things he's done. He just was a very good storyteller, but if you want to get into some deep science, get in, dig deep, he could go with the best of them. He was a brilliant, brilliant man, brilliant astronaut, good friend. And it was sad to see him, uh, see him go so early. Well, we wanted to honor him. Uh, he lived in Melbourne area, involved with ASM uh, fundraisers occasionally. Uh, and uh, he was possibly going to be the astronaut of the day out there at the Space Center to succeed John McBride. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he Bruce, did a lot of events out there. Yeah, he did. Bruce Melnick uh, took it over for a year, and now Winston Scott is uh, running the astronaut corps out there. And the Wrangler that out there is Nick Thomas. Mm -hmm. That uh, uh, Nick uh, certainly has some stories to tell about uh, Sam Durant. He will be missed. And uh, part of what we do on Stay Curious is keep the memories of some of these wonderful people alive, Mikey. Absolutely. We don't want to forget about him and your whole team and these important, important astronomy missions. Yeah, the Astro Restoration, Restoration Project is like a tribute to Sam. Well, we're going to talk about these two missions, all right. Uh, to, to their STS, um, I wanted to get my book and do the... Of course, on the left there's STS-83 and STS-94. Well... They flew a few months apart. Why? And why? Uh, Mikey's going to tell us all about the why here, but I'm going to tell you about the patches real quick. All oh, right, with my cheaters here. <laughs> the patch depicts Columbia launching into space for the first microgravity science laboratory called MSL. Microscience Laboratory will investigate material science, fluid dynamics, biotechnology, and combustion, combustion science in the microgravity environment of space. 
The center circle symbolizes a free liquid under microgravity conditions representing various fluid and material science experiments. Symbolic of the combustion experiments is the surrounding starburst of a blue flame bursting into space. The three-lobe shape of the outermost starburst ring traces the dot pattern of a transmission. Lao photograph of a transmission Liao photograph typical of biotechnological experiments. Now that's an Easter egg buried in there, okay? <laughs> uh, that's the three lobe shape of the uh, uh, outermost starburst ring. All right, traces the dot Patterson of the L A U E Lao photograph typical of biotechnological experiments. The 83 at the, is at the bottom of the patch for the mission number. As a forerunner of future International Space Station missions, it is hoped the scientific results and knowledge gained during the mission will be applied to solving problems on Earth and for the benefit and advancement of humankind. The artist is Mark Pestana, and it, this mission was first launched April 8th, 1997. And uh, it didn't stay up long. Take it away, my friend Mikey Haddad, about the drama of this important mission laying groundwork for the space station science being done 22 years later. Yeah, microgravity was basically microgravity, which dealt, of course, with microgravity effects. And a lot of the things that were done on this mission and previous missions for microgravity would be then directly applied to station because, of course, long duration microgravity is what station's all about. And this was, of course, only a. a uh, the second one was a, a sixty or sixteen day mission, so this was a short term kind of process of what would eventually be applied to space station. Um, there's this this is basically the mission patches, the one on the on the left, and then the one on the right. Of course, is Japanese. The Japanese had a, a furnace that was that flew on that, and so they had their own kind of patch. So these are kind of the I think these are the payload patches where the previous ones were mission patches. Yeah, stickers. Okay. Of course, is the crew. Um, and just want to real quick point out that on the far left is Janice Voss. Her friends, all we all knew her by JV. Very, very good friend. We'll talk about a little bit later. And then, of course, Don Thomas on the far right. Uh, both very good friends of mine. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go on. Jim Hall sells the commander there on the left. Susan Still is a pilot on the right. She would have been a female commander, but her husband was a Navy SEAL. And someone needed to raise the two kids at home. Uh that's what uh, Nick Thomas said, she tells people. <laughs> uh, of course, Janice Voss there on the far left and Don Thomas on the far right. In the back, uh, you've got uh, Michael Gernhardt, Roger Crouch, and Gregory Linteris. Uh, and they were all payload specialists like Don Thomas on there. And Janice was the payload commander. Mm -hmm. So they were all under her uh, guard or she had to take... Uh, the heat for everything that they did wrong <laughs> on there. So uh, so they got up to space, and uh, they lasted how far up there and had to come back? Basically, it was a three-day three day mission. Um, I guess this next the next one, the next picture, is just that's showing the laboratory being prepped in the operations and checkout building. Again, we're looking looking west here. The level four area is in the far end, far background. And then the, as you work towards the, the, the background, the foreground, um, basically, the payload will be ready for launch. And this is a space lab module, basically, as it's being prepared um, for the mission um, for SCS-83. Yeah, we're going to, yeah, we're, we are going to, yeah. I, I did want to set up, though, that the mission had to come back. Yes, it did have and, to come back. And it had, before I... After three days, yeah, and, and basically, it had a fuel cell problem. Okay. And uh, they had to shut down the fuel cell, and from the flight rules is you want to come back because um, you don't want to have less than three fuel cells. So the after three days, why don't they just say we've had enough and, and we'll we'll put this in the queue uh, six months, a year down the road? That was initially the thought. Um, and then what happens is, is, is we'll, we'll see a little bit farther on here, we says, well, what if we just kind of turn things right around? Okay. Um, and this next picture is actually a picture of STS-83. This shows the module to the right, the long tunnel that... that basically connected between the module and the crew compartment which is on the left and then that large section on the very left part of the photograph that's actually the airlock if they had to do a spacewalk marty if you please sir circle or, or or point an arrow to uh I'm, i think it's cool the airlock opening there yep right there's the airlock opening so the bulkhead of columbia is on the left hand side there yes sir uh 
A kind of a long tunnel to scurry down through there. That's like a hamster. Real long tunnel. There. Yeah, so we tried to do as much Alpine racing before we could before that tunnel went in because uh -huh. that is a long way to go down. And, then, of course, the silver platforms, you see the gentleman standing on the the doors, the, the shuttle doors are actually open, okay. and the doors are underneath those platforms. That gained us, that gained us access to, them, to the payload. So. so they're actually on top of the payload doors. Yes. That are covered. Their, did they take the radiators off? No, the radiators stayed on. They just basically... Uh, They've had it to where there's there's space between okay. there. And why is it all padded like that? Uh, for thermal protection. Okay. A lot of times those blankets basically it's like a big thermos keeps it thermally protected, and and so that's why you see a lot of the stuff in white with white blankets mm -hmm. on and stuff. All right. Yeah. And so that's basically where it was in the shuttle. Um, my good is. friend Don Thomas was from Cleveland, and actually I met him. Cleveland Rock. This is one of the ones that's interesting. I didn't actually meet him during the mission. I met him through his wife. I was working on a project at JSC. And we got to talking about things, and I talked about the Cleveland Browns being a team. Like, he said, oh, my husband's a big Cleveland Browns fan. So we went out to dinner that night, met Don, and, of course, that's when I found out, oh, yeah, by the way, my, my husband's an astronaut, too, from <laughs> Cleveland. And so we basically became really good friends because of our link to the Cleveland. He is a huge Cleveland Browns fan. So, And ever, ever since that day, we've been, we've been thinking. You know, yeah, I had him fans. sign a Cleveland Browns football. Okay. I, I didn't think to bring it in today, say, and everyone's going, phew, Mark saved us of that. <laughs> So I just wanted uh, to throw that in. What's Don doing here? He's actually got a pizza. Now, if you look at the record books, it doesn't show this, but he's actually the first person to eat a pizza in space. Huh. Um, the records show that on, I guess, one of the mirror missions or something, the Pizza Hut delivered a pizza to the crew, but that was delivered. He brought this one on board. So he, again, officially, I mean, unofficially, he, he was the first one to eat a pizza in space. I wanted to show this picture of him with that, even though by the record books it doesn't say that. So, as again, my good friend Don with his first pizza, first person to eat pizza in space. I don't know if that personal pizza is from somewhere in the Cleveland area or Akron area. Yeah, it probably yeah. is. Everybody's got yeah. their own little in there. Hey, Marty. I might be wrong, but it looks like there's pineapple on it, which means it's not really a pizza. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> Well, we see Don Thomas the next time doing autographs out there. You'll have to ask him, Marty. Yeah. All right. Bless his heart. He did the astronaut encounter on Easter Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I went out there at the four o'clock signing and, and, uh, one know that, uh, we at the space museum appreciated him doing that for everybody and took him a chocolate bunny out there. To, He's that kind of person that would do yeah, that. Yeah. Really? Just, just that kind a, of guy. Uh, anyone could say, man, I, you know, I thought that'd be one where, Winston Scott would have to do it because everybody'd say they're you know with Easter <laughs> Sunday, but uh, uh, we'll uh, that, that's great a, guy. That's there, a the module during the uh, mission, though, yeah. You should have, some have he will be near your neighborhood someday. I guarantee you, wherever you're at in the fruited plain of America, he's just like that too. He loves talking about space. He does a great talk, and uh, Don Thomas of uh, 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 we we're talking about uh, yeah four flights, forty three days in space. Yeah, PhD right. material sciences from uh, I guess it was uh, Absolutely. Cornell. Uh, yeah. Yep, Cornell. Yep, he went to school with uh, Carl Sagan. Yeah, he graduated flew, in 1982. Flew so. four times. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's everybody going to work. Yeah, that's a right. picture basically inside the module. Um, it's the, there's a glove box. The person on the left is I can't remember their name, but one of the astronauts on the left, he's front of the, in front of the glove box, which is experiment basically rack 12 in the module. And then Don is Lintris and is that Lintris and Crouch yeah. maybe? Or and then Don, yeah, Don's on the right. The other guy yeah, there. he's in front of the Tempest experiment that um, um, was one of the. I think that was the one from the uh, from the Japanese. So imagine this in yeah, the so. uh, operations and checkout building back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, did they run the full experiments there? Uh, some of them did they run the full experiments? Did they really have to have a a, a, a full Rehearsal in the ONC operation. Uh, the, when when this was in the ONC. Oh yeah, yeah. We would do. Our job was to find problems, and so in the operations and checkout building, we would power all this up. We'd integrate it, test it. We powered it all up. We had what's called the mission sequence test, and what that did, you got the timeline. Say sixteen day mission. We would take a slice of time out of that mission. Usually, it was the most aggressive. Uh huh. If anything's going to break, this sure. is where in the mission would break, and we would run that timeline on the ground. Okay. We'd run With it just like the experiments be... going on as the suck power and all that stuff. We have a powered up suck it was in space. We'd mm -hmm. actually trick it to think it's in space. We set the time on the clocks like it was in space. And again, a lot of time the crew would come down because that's what they're going to do on orbit. 
And so they would come down and participate in the mission sequence test. Mm -hmm. And that was our basically dry run. Hey, is this thing going to work? Is everything going to work together? Our job was to find all the problems on the ground. So it was like getting, think of a, a car. When you get in the car, you don't have to rebuild the engine every time. You want to get in the car, turn that key, and go. Yeah. That was our job. Our job was to get all this working so the crew gets in there, pushes that button, and the experiment starts. Okay. And so we had so to they do have a mock-up in JSC to practice on? Yes, sir. Mark-up there, and of course, mark-up mark at the Marshall as well. Okay. Yeah. So. So, but that was, this is during the mission. Um, this is a really neat picture. This is Don Thomas during the SCS-83. Even though it was only a three-day mission, they, and they were able to accomplish some science during that time frame. But he was able to take his picture of Comet Hale Bob during that flight. And I just thought it was a really cool picture. For This is from the shuttle. And that's uh, the thing with film, by the way. And I know that because I took uh, dozens of rolls of film as an amateur astronomer. But uh, I happen to have in our studio wall here, 1996-1997 uh, Comet Hale Bob. This is a painting by Dan Durda. All right. And Dan Durda, uh, he, uh, I've heard he's an astronomer, astrophysicist. That's really neat. And uh, signed by Hale, Alan Hale, and Thomas Bopp right there. On That's the, so neat. On the bottom. And Dan himself. So one of those little things that a uh, space geek like that me, so he neat. hangs on the wall. That's really, over, really neat, Mark. It's over Tucson or Phoenix. Uh, I think it's over Phoenix because that's where Dan was based out of. But it looked pretty beautiful. Uh, it's the best comet we've had in the last 20 years, of course, That's sweet. and looking for the next one there. So uh, thanks for sharing that mm -hmm. with us and let me share that a little bit and uh, share with us a little bit about this beautiful woman. Okay, this is uh, Janice Voss. Our friends call her JV. I met JV uh, early on, again, one during, from my friend Scott um, in, the pro, in the shuttle program, Space Lab program. So we've known her for a number of years. Very, very good friend. She actually became a good friend with um, some of my relatives. And um, another good, another brilliant person, but just can talk and talk to you like you're, hmm. you're just a person next door. She's a real sweetie. Unfortunately, she passed away in uh, 2012, February 2012, from cancer. Uh, but, yeah, she was a very good friend. I just wanted to kind of show this is uh, her as a payload commander for SCS-83. In front of, actually, right behind her is the combustion module. They did flame, flame time to test, and the, all the dials right to her right there are basically uh, 20 bottles that fed that experiment behind her. And we'll talk about Janice a little more here in a few minutes, uh, a sketch of her life there. Okay. But what was really amazing about this was the turnaround of right. how many days and stuff. Marty, would you please take the banner off there at the top? To, uh, yeah, he needs to use that shuttle landing facility. So you put this up here to show us the shortcuts you took to get this up in space in what 80 days 80 yeah 88 days basically what what happens is normally if you look up at the top right you see the shuttle landing facility and this is out and landed it lands there then gets towed to the orbiter processing facility right so normally what happened then we'd have to take the module out of this out of the orbiter Put it in a payload canister. Wheel it down the road to the now, operator. That's the VAB that, where it says order process. Yeah, the VAB is right next to that. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, it's right there. Basically, the, yeah, basically right next to it there. Yeah. So they give you a, a feel for what that is. Uh, that's the northern part, what we call LC39 area. And then we have to transport all the way down to the operations and checkout building, which is about six miles south. And again, that's where we did a lot of integration. Then you have to pull it out of the canister. That's the yellow building. That's the yellow building. Put it back in the stand. Redo all the work. Take it. Put it back in the canister run the canister from the ONC all the way back to the OPF, put it back in the shuttle, connect all the cables, retest. All that would have to be done normally between missions. They said, mm, for this one, we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're actually going to leave it in the orbiter. We're not taking it out of the shuttle. We're going to turn this thing around in 88 days, and we're going to fly it with the same crew, same orbiter, same payload. And tracing on those gang made that happen as well as a lot of people from i'm not just that's from the experiment space lab stem the orbiter people had to do that same thing they had to turn this thing around basically in 56 days when it was normally 80 90 days to turn this orbiter around so it was a real team effort between the orbiter people doing the orbiter work and us payload people doing the payload work to hmm. be able to say leave this thing in the orbiter and it actually it actually is about one eighth the price because um and a lot of time was cut short in fact i've got uh, my one friend, Carrie's, Kevin Zari, who worked on that as well, it took five minutes for one of the tests. And why it was so short, everything's still connected up. Oh, okay. We have what's called brake configuration. Once you pull the cable off, brake configuration. configuration. That's okay. 
Right. Now you got to do all this retest because when you connect it up, you got to retest, and some of these cables have 20, 128 pins on them. None of that had to be happened because we didn't take anything apart. Everything remained in the shuttle. Everything remained cabled up. And so it was very quick to be able to turn things around and not have to do a bunch of retests because it all stayed together. But there was things that had to be done inside the module. There were things that had to be done on the shuttle to be able to get it to refly again. So this is a very unique only time in a shuttle program that we're able to turn something around that quick and fly the same crew on the same orbiter with the same payload. We're going to show you one of those shortcuts that they did in just a minute, mm -hmm. uh, graphically. Marty, I've got a question that popped in my head. I don't know if you specifically remember this mission, but would it be normal or do you think they changed the three engines out? The three engines got this bird to orbit uh, uh, one time, you know, uh, in uh and then, then in April, and then the reflight in May. Yeah, any any time you light the engines, you have to change them out. Okay, so yeah. they would go. They'd have to take the engines out too there in the OPS. So that would be a uh, a routine but time consuming thing to do for the orbiter mm -hmm. in there. Well, you threw this. Uh, thank you, Marty. Uh, you threw this in there. Uh, and that was yeah. That was I guess the reason for the for the short mission was a fuel cells. There's three fuel cells on there. Now, these are the fuel cells for Endeavor. The ones for Columbia, actually, yeah, fuel cell one is on the starboard side, two and three on the port side. But this kind of gives you this is a good graphic showing where the fuel cells are, the very forward part underneath that white liner. That the square, that yellow squares there. Yeah, they actually, they're, they're the black ones where the fuel cells Yeah, and the uh -huh. yellow, yellow squares, yeah. Right. And so that was basically why 83 was cut short. They had a fuel cell two problem. Basically, the mixing of the oxygen and hydrogen wasn't going as planned. It could have been a very dangerous situation, so they had to shut fuel cell two down and they had to bring the orbiter home early that was why we came home early and i just wanted to show kind of this is a graphic showing the fuel cells yeah. and kind of the all stuff kinds of tanks down. all over this orbiter yeah. there it's very interesting buried underneath the payload bay there yeah but uh to shortcut this uh to do everything you'd have to go in the the hatch uh there and then go down in the mid deck and then go through the whole tunnel to even get back in there to checking things out so you, you found an easier way. Yeah, what they did is they decided to pull the tunnel out. This is actually a crane operation pulling the tunnel out. Um, think of it if the, the orbiter mid-deck is on the right, the space lab module is on the left there, and then, of course, a long tunnel. Uh, with that tunnel in place, if you had to do any work in the module, the only way to do it was go in through the crew compartment, all the way down that long tunnel, up through that joggle, that 90 degree, 290 degrees, into the module. There would have been no way. And so <laughs> what they <laughs> basically they pulled the tunnel out. And so you pull the tunnel out, so then you have direct access to the module. The crew has direct access to the shuttle where the fuel cells are on there. And so it, it just helped by getting that tunnel out of the way. And this is a picture of basically the, the orbiter crew. You see the liner removed. The fuel cells are kind of in the open area there where it's, it, you can see it's kind of a dark area with the, the liner removed. And they, they're actually prepping. That's um, looking into the, the, the lab part. That's actually looking in the, in the, the mid-deck. That's looking forward into where the mid deck is. That's the airlock and stuff with the oh, opening okay. and, the, and the yellow duct. Oh, that I got you. Okay, that's all right. So the so so that's, lab's behind you. Lab's so behind that's you. looking to the. Yeah. Ca I see the the windows at the top. Yeah. There too. And so that's a good shot of the orbiter people having to do their thing on the orbiter, and of course we were working on the module at the same time to do whatever was required there to get this thing ready to fly in less than three months. Now, would you get would you get to know your fellow colleague by uh, his feet? Whose feet they be hanging out of there? There was that. In fact, I got a, got a little something from Tracy here I wanted to read real quick. He says, our team got to be regulars in the, basically the OPF because of the short turnaround. They became regulars every day going to the OPF. Um, we had to come up with minimum level requirements to turn around the payloads and to do any preventive maintenance and health checks to turn them around for the reflight. Um, they said uh, so we had to retrieve experiment samples to give it to the principal investigators and refurbish them before reinstalling. The team really had to move fast to develop requirements, write procedures, and execute the operations and work um, well within the USA team, which is the people that worked on the orbiter and, of course, in the OPF and then and, and the, the payload team. So it was a lot of work, a lot of people doing. And this is actually a picture inside the module during that refurbishment between flights. This is actually the crew. There's actually three crew members in there in the bunny suits and one of the, uh, I think it's a, a technician or a quality person to the left there. And they're basically doing turnaround of the guts of the space lab module. Again, all the hardware and all the racks were still together, but all those little piece parts that we needed to do refurbishment mates on, this is the crew in there doing that. Because they'd use them for three days. They'd use them for yeah. three days and everything kind of worked and the things, it was actually very successful. Um, 
even though they had to cut the mission short, the, sp the space lab itself was very successful. So this is basically doing retune maintenance. This is the, the team for the STS-94, the payload team. They worked at basically that turnaround. Um, again, you see a lot of people involved in making this happen. Mm -hmm. It was a huge effort between the payload side and the orbiter people to be able to get this thing to fly in 88 days. Just an amazing accomplishment. Hats off to all these people that were able to pull it off um, to get this thing ready to fly again. Yeah, just amazing, amazing work. Amazing group of people. You know, and uh, I love pictures like these. Uh, the people, of course, is what NASA and the contractors are all about. And we celebrate the space workers like no one else here at the American mm -hmm. Space Museum. And uh, I've never had a group photo of anywhere I've worked uh, <laughs> achieving anything, you know, uh, get the whole newsroom out in front of the, the, the newspaper or the Associated Press office and take our picture out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I always think it's a neat thing. It, it obviously always builds good uh, uh, family camaraderie within the, your mm -hmm. team, correct? And you get to see all those people in those photographs. So you start looking at those photographs. And remember, oh, yeah, I forgot so-and-so worked that. Yeah. And I hadn't seen them in years. And it's just the, all those people getting together to for one goal to refly this mission again. And so. uh, all involved with our wonderful space shuttle program, three decades that has changed our world, brought us into the 21st century, without a doubt. Where there you've got... Okay, now, yeah, this is two of the crew members. What happens is, is you got, usually everything's in the space lab module. What this is, is actually an experiment that was in the mid-deck area, was pulled out of the mid-deck, that's a plant, uh, deals with plant growth and put into what's called the express rack. It was, it was a rack, the express rack for space station. It was a precursor to the space station. The idea was, the express rack was you could bring experiments in and out. They keep the rack there, but what goes in and out of the rack could be changed out for space station. This was kind of the first run at that. They pulled this from the mid-deck area and they put it in the express rack that was in the space lab module uh, for this mission. And it was very successful and worked very well. And so this is just a picture of that showing that, hey, they pulled out of the mid-deck, put it in the space lab module, was there for the mission, and then before coming home, they pulled this back out, put it back in the mid-deck. So it showed that an express rack configuration concept would work for space station, and that's what's actually being done today. This was a precursor to the express rack on Excellent. space station. Excellent. Yeah. Outstanding. So I wanted to show that. Yeah. Are, are they kind of even the same dimensions on the space station now? Yeah, the express rack is yeah very various dimensions depending on what you're flying. But the rack itself is the same, and the mm -hmm. the inserts are basically depending on what the, what the uh, the main insert is the same basically. So you can fly basically that that configuration, the interfaces and the um, are all all kind of a standard interface. So mm -hmm. um, whatever you put in there basically has the same kind of interfaces. It's very very interchangeable. Well, I know Doug Forrest is enjoying today watching this in Los Angeles area. Lindsey Smith, Dave Stangy, Space Monkey, Robert Law, and Bill Whiting, Tom Musiak. Uh, Tommy's got a great photo we're going to post. He was at the Apollo 15 launch okay. that was uh, on 1971, this date in space history. Wow. Uh, Gary Gerald, Christopher Mick, Tom Celentano, and Neil 1030 are watching. Uh, and we appreciate that and telling your friends. Thank um, you, everybody, for, for participating. Yeah, Thank we've you. got uh, Fairville Hartley, Steve Hammer, Carlton Bailey, Hazel Banks. Thank you all. And they're reminding us that there's a Falcon Heavy launch tonight. Yes, sir. Marty, I forget the time is right a little after 11 or? I think it's about 11.30. About 11.30 there. Falcon Heavy launch tonight. We haven't had the, the evening storms, so... Uh, that, I'll stay up for that. And the booster landings on the ground. Oh, are the they? The boosters will be coming back to the, to the, the Air Force Ooh. side. Yep. Gee, you got sure. a pretty nice little place over there on Cocoa Beach, Mikey. We watch them all. We're right to the ground. Uh -huh. You can see them come right to the ground there. Yep. Well, you enjoy that tonight. We're going to share a little bit about your friend here, Janice. We want people to know she was born in South Bend, Indiana uh, on October 8th, 1856. She passed away from breast cancer at age 55. In January 2012 um, she uh, was a Purdue not from the University of Purdue and uh, also uh, the Draper laboratory at Massachusetts Institute of Technology where she got her master's in science uh, and as you said uh, a lot like Sam Durant she you know she didn't have to prove she was the smartest person in the room right mm -hmm. she was a sweetie very and, brilliant uh, person. I love this from October 2000, after her retirement from NASA, 
She was the science director for NASA's Kepler Space Observatory. This is a very important observatory mm -hmm. in finding Earth-like extrasolar planets around nearby planetary systems. I didn't know that mm -hmm. until I read that. That's uh, that's that's carrying her her uh, astronomy roots uh, right to the end there. Mm -hmm. But uh, told Mikey I was going to share this uh, of her inspiration to be an astronaut came from Madeline Le Engel's 1962 novel A Wrinkle in Time. The book tells a story of a young woman who must travel through time to save her father. In the book, the young girl's mother is a Nobel Prize winning biologist. Voss claims that the powerful uh, roles did not strike her as unusual, but uh, were the norms she accepted in life as far as strong women in her life. She flew a copy of A Wrinkle in Time on board STS-94 and mailed it to Madeline Le Engel. Isn't that something? Yeah. That's JV. Uh, that's nice. Well, God bless her and her family and all her friends like you, Mikey. There's a, there's a beautiful way that mm -hmm. uh, there's a personal picture. Yeah, this is basically my place in, in, in Florida here. With Scott Vaughn on the left, JV next to him, my cousin Lisa and myself. Um, the reason I put this up is my cousin Lisa and JV became very good friends. They're both chocoholics. Oh, JV yeah. was a... She got chocolate from all over the world, and she'd come back and she'd share it with my cousin Lisa. So this was, I think, before JV's last flight. She was in Florida, so she came by our place for the day and just, just mm -hmm. a real, real super person. Uh, this is actually a JSC called the Astronaut Grove, which is a place where they plant a tree uh, for each of the astronauts that have passed. And this was during, we, myself, Scott Vaughn, another friend, Riley Dern, uh, another level four person, um, flew out there uh, for the memorial. That's her parents there on the right with the reef. And this hmm. is basically dedication. This is the tree they planted for JV. Well, there. that's that's moving. When I was at Johnson Space Center, that's sort of where you go in in the entrance. And mm -hmm. you look to the left, I believe, and there's this grove of, of, of trees of trees honoring the astronauts yeah. there. And isn't there a bench, too? Benches uh, they've around got that, and I think there's actually a walkway where you can walk and around. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's a nice area to go to if you ever get a chance. It certainly is. We... Uh, and uh, on a lighter note, there is uh, Don Thomas wearing yep. the greatest football player of all time's journey, the late Mr. Jim Brown. Jim Brown, yeah. I was doing a, I do the docent for the Atlantis exhibit, and Don would come down to do Astronaut Encounter. He heard I was there, so he came over. Of course, there's this Brown jersey on, and so I wanted to get a picture, show a picture of Don and I together. That was 2013. Anyway, well, thank you, Cliff yeah. Watson, for donating 200 stars to us, Cliff. And O.C. Walker is watching today. And... Uh, down the cliffs in Pomona, Australia, Whoa, okay, on the uh, great. east coast. Uh, okay. Well, it's not great because it's winter time down there. Well, that's true. <laughs> it's good right. to we get, uh, ship us some of that cool weather up here, <laughs> Cliff Watson. A uh, good buddy I met during the, the great solar eclipse five years ago with Dave Renicky, awesome. a big popularizer of uh, astronomy there. In, uh, uh, so uh, want to thank you all. And also wanted to mention you watching on YouTube. There is a, if you slide the bar around there on YouTube, where you make your comments, there's a place to, it says thanks, and you can donate money to the America Space Museum directly to YouTube, and we're going to be telling you about that because we're a nonprofit and we need bushel baskets full of $100 bills to keep <laughs> this go. place full there. But uh, uh, Mikey, uh, awesome job as usual. There's your, your book. And that's actually uh, the, the website too for we got this for anybody at Work Space Lab. Please go here. Just tell us what you did, or people can go here and um, and see what people have done for the Space Lab program. Um, before we end, there is one thing I want to mention. Um, last month, I talked about the Astronaut Corps. I was actually a finalist in the, uh, 1998 for the class of 98. There's 121 of us. Um, there were finalists. I was I was one of that 121. 25 got picked, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens kind of is you get picked, and this is in June. And they want you to basically be in Houston by August. So that's like two uh, two months. For somebody single like me, that was no problem. But I can see people with families and kids. That wouldn't be wouldn't be interesting. Anyways, um, I didn't get picked, and I wanted it more than anything I wanted to be an astronaut. To be an astronaut the... because we worked the astronauts. Astronauts are friends. Okay. Well, my brother said, Mikey, there's some reason you didn't get picked. And I'm a believer too on things happening for a reason. He says there is some reason why you did not get picked even though you wanted it more than anything. Well, next year I met my wife. Oh. And how Florida. long have you been together? We've been together, happy marriage, 21 years. Excellent. And if I had gotten picked, 
I would have been in Houston and I never would have met my wife. And right. So that was the reason why I was not picked. Was You'd have probably been through going through your third wife by now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a reflection of astronauts and their lifestyle. But I wanted to tell that that was the most important people, part. and yeah. it takes a special yeah. spouse to put up with uh, not being home alone. Yeah, but I, I, that was probably the most important thing on not getting picked, and I didn't mention that last month. No, I, I did. Wanted to and do and that. I left my note over on the table. Thanks for bringing that up, so. because you and Scott Vongan, who also we've had on this show, uh, were uh, he was actually a backup to Sam Durant, so would have gone if one of them gotten sick. Mm -hmm. Uh, very special people, the payload specialists. They do not get the astronaut pin going to space. Charlie Walker taught us that when we talked to Charlie. Been to space three times. No pin. That's that's reserved for the astronaut uh, um, uh, yeah, the classes. Kind of, yeah, to kind of give you an like idea, that. the astronauts in the fly, the, the commander and pilot and then mission specialists, they're career astronauts. The payload specialists are basically picked by the science community and usually you're only for one or two missions. And that's why it's a little different there. Well, Mikey, thank you for uh, staying curious with us there. I wanted to put up the uh, website for the Astro Restoration Project, another nonprofit. You can go there and help them out if, if you wish there. Uh, but, Mikey, we really thank you. Have Look what I found I'm going to give you here. I'm uh, going, going through some stuff there. Okay. Uh, it's in German on the front, on the back. Uh, Deutsche Space Lab Mission D1. Thank my you. Friend. Yep, that was it. A little swag out of the archives. I was fishing thank around you. in today thank looking at stuff. Thank you very much. So yeah, I worked Thank you, really. We, Appreciate we can't it, thank you enough for your whole level four group of people wanting to be involved with us, like uh, Maynette and Scott and just a great group of people and you write about them in this book and uh though it's very technical you can get it on amazon right mm -hmm. so, yes sir in there so we look forward to mikey being in august when we talk about a one of the payloads of the shuttles of august and uh it never ends uh, the fascination for all this and yep. i think it shows by the the great group of people we had watching today marty thank you for a wonderful Streamlabs job anything from your end to button up before we go out yep we're good to go out ah well <laughs> a little beverage thank you free to go out tomorrow we're going to talk about skylab we're going to this specifically the skylab smith program as well as the second crew skylab 3 going up to mm, okay. the america's first space station 50 years ago and of course it's the launch of apollo 15 tomorrow in history in 1971 uh the first time we took a car to the moon and one of the coolest landing places of all popped over a giant mountain and there's a big reel from a lava to something. collapse there so hadley reel was the place so thank you all for staying curious with today until tomorrow when we bring you space history like no one else i'm mark marquette saying i can't wait to bridge the space between us thanks again brother you're welcome it's a pleasure as always mark yeah. a lot of fun <laughs>